So um, I'm going to start with some basics related to um, regulatory considerations for medical devices. Um, starting out with some basic definitions, um, it's really important to understand from a Food and Drug Administration or FDA perspective what is a medical device. And on your screen you'll see a very long definition uh, that FDA applies to medical devices. Um, I'm not going to read through it, you, you're, everybody can read it on their screen, but what I do want to really stop and talk about a little bit is the highlighted text in the middle. Uh, so a medical device is intended for use in the diagnosis of diseases or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. That aspect of the de definition is really important uh, and in consideration of uh, you know, anything that we're working on that constitutes a medical device, um, again, that definition of uh, diagnosing, curing, mitigation, or treating, or prevent preventing disease uh, becomes really important uh, because that's what de FDA applies as a definition. So what is an investigational device? Um, from an FDA perspective, it's a medical device that is subject of a clinical study design, designed to evaluate the safety, effectiveness, or, or, safe, or the, evaluate the effectiveness and or safety of the device. So, uh, you know, devices, and I'll get into this a little bit later, uh, but devices that require clinical trials um, to move forward to prove uh, effectiveness or safety. Uh, again, this FDA uses this definition uh, for a medical device that uh, effectively is an investigational device. So you have a great idea. Um, I'm not completely familiar with everybody's projects, but uh, you know, I, I did listen in on a number of the projects just now this afternoon. So, you know, the, there are great ideas that you have, and you have to jump through this, this hoop, this regulatory hoop, um, for a successful trial or, or a marketed medical device or even publication, whatever your, your specific motivation is. Um, and what I want to talk about right now is, is what some of these key regulations or this hoop that you have to jump through to, to get to your end goal. Um, it's important to understand um, the, the actual regulations, so the Code of Federal Regulations um, that apply to medical devices, um, and there's a host of them here. Um, some of the highlighted ones uh, apply for, you know, clinical studies that may be needed uh, in the development of your medical device, including protection of human subjects, um, institutional review boards. Uh, if you're proceeding with a uh, study or a clinical trial that involves human research, uh, institutional review boards are uh, critical to that process. Uh, and then some of the marketing uh, aspects of the FDA regulations, including uh, the pre-market notification or 510K regulations, uh, the pre-market approval of medical devices or PMA process are all in the Code of Federal Regulations. And further, uh, if you need an, invest an investigational device exemption for your device to move forward, um, those regulations are, are listed here as well. Um, you know, if, if you're losing sleep and you're having trouble sleeping, I would, I would encourage you to pick these regulations up and start reading them because you'll be able to fall asleep quickly. But with that said, it's important to understand where to find uh, the information that you need moving forward with your particular aspects of your development of your medical device. So this slide represents the, the critical process uh, from an FDA perspective of how a medical device moves through the approval process. So starting on your left with your concept and design, um, you know, what, what I will say is the timelines listed on the bottom of each box um, is, is a rough guesstimate for how long some of these uh, time frames are, but each medical device development process or, or device process uh, obviously will have its, its variable timelines. Uh, but again, you start out with your concept and design, uh, you go through your preclinical engineering development, and then if you need to move into clinical trials, um, if it's a significant risk device, which I'll get into in a second, you do need to go to the FDA for an investigational device exemption or IDE application. 
Um, again, if your device uh, needs clinical trials to um, move forward with the development of the device, you would go through those. Um, and then the marketing pathways, again, towards the bottom of that green box, 510K pathway or uh, a PMA pathway is listed. Uh, you submit that to the FDA, which they review. Um, 510K takes roughly three to five months uh, to go through the FDA process. And the PMA process is 12 to 24 months. And then uh, after that, you begin patient access and then reimbursement assignment, and you go through those details. Medical devices are divided into class and risk. This is a fundamental uh, for medical device uh, research uh, or, or regulations. Uh, your, class, your classes are listed on the left, class one through three. Uh, and then your risk uh, is set up by non-significant risk or significant risk. These are two really important aspects of medical devices um, and, and thinking about both the regulatory pathway and the commercialization pathway uh, to move forward with uh, your development process. Um, graphically represented a little bit differently, um, as your patient risk increase uh, noted on the left axis there, um, your regulatory controls increase. So the, the bars on the graph represent your classes. So class one uh, represented here has the least amount of patient risk and also the least amount of regulatory controls. Uh, moving up to class three, those are your devices that have the most patient risk. Therefore, you're subjected to the uh, highest level of regulatory controls. Device classes, again, class one uh, through three, class one are considered low to moderate risk devices, uh, which require general controls. Uh, examples of class one devices are elastic bandages, examination gloves, handheld surgical instruments, things of that nature. Uh, class two devices, uh, considered moderate to high risk, uh, require special and general controls. Uh, examples are powered wheelchairs, infusion pumps, surgical drapes. Uh, in class three are, again, the highest risk class of devices um, where either there is insufficient information to determine the adequacy of general controls and performance standards or special controls, or these devices are used in life-supporting, life-sustaining, uh, they're implantable devices, or uh, devices that present potentially unreasonable risk of illness or injury. What do we mean by general and special controls? Well, general controls, uh, you know, you have to consider uh, prohibition against adulterated or misbranded devices. Uh, good manufacturing practices apply uh, under general controls. There's uh, provisions for labeling, uh, registration of manufacturing facilities. Uh, you have to list your device types. There's rec record keeping controls uh, in repair, replacement, or refund. Uh, in the event of recalls. Uh, and special controls really deal, uh, deal with performance standards. Uh, you need to uh, put in controls for post-market surveillance, uh, patient registries if needed, uh, development, dissemination of guidelines or guidance. You have to implement design controls and recommendations and appropriate actions, and you also have to track those devices. Um, in January 2006, uh, the FDA put out this guidance document, and uh, this is one of the primary aspects of uh, moving forward with a medical device uh, in the development process and whether you need uh, clinical trials and specifically if you need an investigational device exemption application approved by the FDA before you can move forward with your clinical studies. Um, and again, uh, by the title of this document, Significant Risk and Non-Significant Risk Medical Device Studies, um, the, the important component of this document is the fact that uh, FDA walks you through uh, some decision trees and uh, gives you examples of things that are significant and non-significant risk, uh, because this, again, depending on the uh, risk classification of the device, uh, determines on how you move forward with any of the clinical studies that may be necessary uh, throughout your uh, device development process. So who decides whether a device is significant or non-significant risk? Well, it starts with the individual sponsor investigator. 
So you make uh, in the initial risk determination and you present this information to your local investigate or your institutional review board uh, with, with the information so that the IRB can then make that determination. The IRB is required to determine whether the device study involves uh, a significant or non-significant risk. Uh, for an investigational device that is considered to be non-significant risk, technically uh, the FDA allows that local IRB to be their surrogate and the IRB can uh, approve the quote-unquote IDE. So you do not need to go to the FDA and if uh, the IRB does believe that's a non-significant risk device. Um, with that said, if the IRB does determine that it is a significant risk device uh, by statute, you are automatically have to go to the FDA uh, and submit an, an investigational device exemption application uh, to be able to conduct that study. And further, the FDA is available to help, uh, noting that they are the final arbiter, so uh, whatever the FDA uh, finally rules on a risk determination um, that uh, determination is final. Um, you are exempt from uh, the IDE regulations if you're using uh, the device in accordance with the in indications and labeling, if it's a non-invasive diagnostic, if it's something being used for consumer preference testing or solely for veterinary use or research on or uh, with lab animals. Um, I'll just note that an IDE application uh, is lots of paper. Um, there's also uh, an electronic file that you need to make of uh, your paper copy. Um, investigators really uh, a lot of times don't have the time to generate this IDE submission. Uh, and oftentimes uh, folks don't understand the regulations and how to navigate this. So. Um, you know, the reason I bring this up and show this picture is it, it, it is a lot of paperwork and if you are involved with a significant risk device that does need to go through uh, some level of clinical trials and you have to go through the IDE process, um, it, it can be a time consuming process. If you do need to go to the FDA uh, with an investigational device exemption application, um, this quickly represents uh, the types of uh, or what your responsibilities are as a sponsor investigator of an investigational device exemption um, talks about the what type of submission responsibilities uh, you would have under these circumstances and when uh, the timing of those submissions are required. I won't go into too much more detail about that. Um, FDA approval or clearance to market a device. Um, so, you know, moving forward from the regulatory aspects, you know, discussing the commercialization process, uh, FDA requirements to market the device. For class one devices, they are most, uh, mostly exempt uh, from the FDA approval process. Um, class two devices, uh, most of uh, the class two devices go through the 510K process. Uh, some of some class two devices are exempt from the 510k process. Uh, just to note, class three devices uh, do require PMA approval. Uh, recall that class three devices uh, have the most risk to patients, and so again, uh, you have to go through the most rigorous approval process through the FDA for pre-market approval. Uh, these application applications are quite onerous and. Uh, many volumes of information need to be submitted through that. Pre-market notification uh, through the 510K process, uh, devices that are considered to be substantially equivalent to a device already on the market or a predicate device, so these are the requirements for the 510K process. Uh, after 510K review, the device is considered cleared by the FDA. Uh, FDA receives roughly three to 4,000 submissions uh, through the 510K process per year. Uh, I, gave, I gave a, a web link to the FDA uh, that describes the 510K uh, process at the bottom of the page here. <coughs> Pre-market approval application or PMA, uh, again, required for most class three devices. Uh, also required for new types of devices that have no predicate device. Uh, may require preclinical and clinical data obtained from a clinical investigation. 
uh, a PMA application requires FDA approval. Again, so you submit the application, the FDA reviews, and there is an approval process for that. Uh, and you can see that there's only roughly 30 to 50 submissions per year for this, again, because it is a very laborious, onerous process to go through this. And again, there's a web link at the bottom if you care to know more about this process. And then I'll end uh, with additional resources. Uh, CD, CDRH has an FDA Learn course, uh, a series of modules. Uh, the link is here. Um, I've gone through a number of these, and they're actually quite good. So if there's any aspect of, of what I presented today that you'd like to know more about, uh, please feel free to follow this web link. Uh, 